Thank you for joining us for Small Houses, Big Woods, Archaeology of Tenants and Small Landholders. Dr. Jim Gibb will be our guest speaker tonight. My name is Allison and I work for St. Mary's County Library and I'll be facilitating the event. All right, are we ready to get started? I am. So, um, yeah, tonight's talk is a work in progress. And uh, I was inspired to talk about it because over the years doing uh, commercial archaeology, uh, me and the crew were often in the woods stumbling around. And we often stumble across these small house sites. And by that, I mean a small house. Um, and we've been, my colleagues have been doing the same thing. And every single one of them gets written off as uh, not historically significant. Uh, so we kind of note their presence, we get a site number for them and that's that. Uh, and it seems to me um, we shouldn't do that. And so this is my first foray into this issue. So what's a small house? Um, I haven't worked out the numbers yet, but generally we're talking about simple uh, buildings. Uh, they're not masonry. They're really small, like 300 to 600 square feet. There's some that may even be less than that. So we're talking, I think we have one house that's uh, 20 by 14 and a half feet. That's a small house. Uh, typically, they don't have full foundations. Uh, they just have piers, or if they have a, they might have a footer of just a bunch of field stone on which the building's set. Uh, they don't have big fireplaces as a rule. Uh, they have a simple stove, uh, sort of a parlor stove to heat and cook with. And we know that because of the chimney. Uh, the chimney bases, when we find them, are usually about a foot and a half on the side. So that's about all they're good for. And in many respects, not all that different from the chimneys a lot of our, our houses have today uh, for furnaces. Often there's an associated outbuilding, um, small. Some of the outbuildings are still standing. And typically they date to the late historic period, you know, 1880s through, let's say, 1950. So the question is, who cares? Why do we care about these buildings? Why are they important or are they important? Uh, and as I noted, you know, when I just started, it's that we, we find these sites a lot. They're, they're quite common. And the people who occupy these buildings uh, often have left virtually no trace in the written record. Maybe it will show up in the censuses, but very little else. So we don't know a lot about them. Or on the other hand, a sizable proportion of uh, the population of, of Maryland and Southern Maryland lived in these small houses and out of the way places. Uh, and they're the ones who did all the work. So it, it seems to me they're worth pursue, you know, pursuing. Oh, it must be the wrong slideshow. That's not a small house, is it? All right, smaller house. Uh, this is just a map of a, um, a farmstead. And like Bel Air Mansion, which I just showed you, that's not what this talk is about. These farmsteads that we find are not the subject of this talk. You know, we, 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 we do a lot of research on these rural farmsteads, uh, usually mid 19th century into early 20th century. Uh, Prince George's County actually has a, a document that uh, kind of summarizes what we know and lays out the research questions. So these are not at issue. This is a site actually in uh, near Gallant Green in Charles County. This is more like what we're talking about. This is a small house up in uh, deep woods in Crownsville in Anne Arundel County, uh, really up in some high ground uh, in what is now a wildlife management area, recre recreation area. Uh, any, but even this, it's got a you know full fieldstone foundation. It's got a cellar hole, um, has chimney falls. So you know we know it was a heated building and therefore was a house. Uh, all the circles around, of course, are shovel test pits that we've dug, and then we instrument map the site, and those contour lines simply represent concentrations of um, architectural material. You will notice, however, that there are two concentrations, one right around the building itself, one to the upper uh, right, and that's probably some sort of outbuilding. 
So even this, uh, it's probably what, 20 by 30 feet. Even this really isn't what we're looking for. What we do find out in the woods, we often find the remains of uh, relic roads um, shown as these kind of linear depressions uh, lacking trees. Uh, and if you if you follow one, if you're in the woods and you follow one of these long enough, it looked to either side sort of, you know, let's say 50 to 100 feet on the other side of a, a road like this. Sooner or later, you're going to find one of these houses. And sometimes you see this on the surface. Uh, you'll see trash. These are um, these are late historic sites. Uh, often in upland areas where we don't get a lot of soil formation. So the site is really on the surface. We don't have to do any digging, it is there. And so mostly what we do is simply map what's there. In this case, you know, we have a bed and I don't know, there might be part of a sink there in the middle foreground. One of the problems with these sites is very often we find a, a large amount of trash on the surface. With some of them, that trash is almost solely beer and liquor bottles. And this in the past has been a problem because, you know, do we want to, you know, we have a little site, the surface is covered with alcohol bottles. Is this something that we want to attend a public hearing for Historic Preservation Commission or a planning board meeting and talk about this site being historically significant with all these liquor bottles on the ground? And that's one of the things that shied me away from, you know, recommending that they are historically significant. But what I've learned over the last several years is very often when we see that kind of pattern, what we're looking at are uh, squatters, long, you know, after that site is really abandoned by the people who built and maintained it. And so the, the bottles on the surface really aren't representative of the people who actually live there and farm the land. The other case is where we find all kinds of trash and not necessarily lots of liquor bottles, but all kinds of other bottles and ceramics and bed springs and all kinds of stuff. And clearly what's going on in those cases, not this case here, is that that site has been used by a commercial trash hauler. So there's somebody with a truck probably in the 1960s or earlier uh, has subscriptions, goes around to various households that pay a certain amount each month, picks up their trash, this is before curbside collection, brings it to a particular site and dumps it. And so the trash on the surface kind of obscures the earlier house site there, and that's a problem. Um, those kinds of sites are hard to deal with. Here's a standing example of what I think a lot of these houses look like, and this is um, Oh, just a little south, as I recall, of BWI Airport in Anne Arundel County. And it, it's, uh, it's a house that's barely 15 feet wide and 20 feet long, two stories. The door where this fishing net is hanging, the door has actually been filled in. The house has been added to, as you'll see in a moment. This is a house built by an African-American family that was considered by standards of the day to be fairly well-to-do for an African-American family. Uh, so the building survives, there's additions to it. But I think this is the kind of thing we're looking at. The skirting along the base of the wall hides the piers that it's sitting on, but it does not have a full foundation. You could see at the roof line, it's got a chimney uh, that's serving a uh, parlor stove. So here's that house. and. I don't know how well you could see my mouse moving around, but this is the original part here. And it's had several additions to it. We know there was a smokehouse here because a descendant of the people who built the house said there was a smokehouse here. And we have a dug well here, which is still visible on the surface. A privy, which uh, we found traces of and our informant tells us was a privy. We also have a spigot here. But that spigot isn't for a well on site. There's actually a water line that runs from that spigot to another house closer to the road. So they were getting their water basically from another house in more recent years. But this house was probably built around 1880. 
and some drawings of it. So here in the upper left-hand corner is what the original, this is the original part here. This is an addition here. Um, and from the back of it, again, you could see additions, the main house. The side views, you could see uh, the original house uh, additions. And then these are the, you can actually see the phases of the house construction. So the original house is here. It, it probably, you'll hear this phrase a lot. It was probably a hall and parlor design. And we're seeing that with one small house after another. This is a design that dates back at least to the 17th century. When we dig 17th century houses, that's what we have a hall, which is roughly equivalent to a kitchen and a parlor, which usually means sort of the principal bedroom uh, for the heads of household and then rooms upstairs. But in this case, we, that's the first phase. An addition was added, whoops, sorry about that. An addition was added for bathroom. A summer kitchen was built and then a wing attaching the summer kitchen to the main house and another addition off the back here. But this is an unusual example of one of these buildings in that it has survived for close to 150 years. Um, but then it was occupied by a relatively well-to-do family, uh, African-American family, uh, and a rather large one too. Apparently there were 13 people occupying this building at one time. When we do the archeology span around, when we do the shovel test pits, you see all these red dots that's, um, uh, trash that showed up in every, every one of those shovel test pits, uh, vessel glass in this one here. You can see all those purple fill circles. This is all was in, this was a truck gardening. Uh, so these folks were raising fruits and vegetables for local markets. And it's a pretty good example of them uh, fertilizing the ground with household garbage, which they collected locally. And this again, we got from the informant Instead of uh, those of you who've heard my other talk of, about uh, garbage being picked up in Baltimore, Washington, trucked out to these farms, fed the pigs, and then the manure or whatever trash was left over spread across the fields. These folks, it looks like it's a different pattern where they're just collecting household garbage in the area, feeding it to the pigs. And the pigs were along the back property line, this um, eastern third of the properties where they kept pigs. And then they spread that manure and they use that to grow uh, uh, fruits and vegetables for local market. Uh, an example of the kinds of things we find, you're going along in the woods, middle of the woods and you know, in amongst the leaves, you start seeing brick. If you see brick, you got a house site. In this case, follow my arrow, you could just about make it out. There is the base of a stove chimney right here. It's roughly a foot and a half on the side, and the brick to the left of it is the chimney fall. So that marks a house. In this map, you could see it. Um, it's a little fuzzy, but this is the chimney fall. And then we mapped in several piers, brick and stone piers that would have supported this building. You could see from the scale down here, this thing is, you know, maybe 25 feet long at most. Uh, and under, you know, 15 to 20 feet wide. The chimney uh, emanates at, I think, this point right in the center. So there's probably a division wall that ran through this thing, dividing it into hall and parlor. We didn't do any excavation. We're just mapping the site. It's still there. Uh, this, again, is up in the Crownsville area in Anne Arundel County. And another one, that same neck of the woods, uh, manifest as a whole bunch of rocks on the surface. Um, you know, we had a backpack in, uh, you could see uh, the pack over here that has our total station in it for mapping this thing. And that looks something like this after we mapped it. So you can see it's a bunch of stones representing a footer, a stone footer, a big cluster here representing the fireplace. My guess is it had a fireplace and not a stove. Uh, there was some brick there, certainly, but most of it is field stone. So it looks like they actually had open hearth cooking and heating with this building. And it's got, again, there's two parts here. Uh, so it may be hall and parlor, or this may just be a, 
sort of a storage part of a single room structure here. Uh, the artifacts suggest, again, late 19th, early 20th century, including this hoe blade. And on the right is part of a cast iron kettle. Uh, both of these kinds of artifacts seem to be showing up with some regularity on these small sites. So the hoe probably for gardening, uh, the cauldron certainly for cooking, or if it's large enough, washing clothes or making soap or something along those lines. And we find these same sites, the same kinds of artifacts on 17th and 18th century sites. This is an example of a site that's at Cirque. Uh, it's called the Brown Tenancy. It's out in back of the Selman House in the woods. And University of Maryland did some work on it, I think in 2015. Uh, Dana Link and I went back more recently to do a little more troweling around to answer a few questions, but clearly the base of the chimney was right here. This is the base of the chimney. The whole thing has fallen over. And this is the map that we've created modifying what the University of Maryland did. And you can see it, we've got a small building here. It's set on brick piers. Uh, these squares represent Maryland's excavation units. There was a walkway, uh, south central part of the building. Uh, these contour lines, well, we have topography here, but the reddish ones are architectural material. So we obviously, we have a lot around the building, but we also have a concentration over to the right, a small one to the left. These probably represent outbuildings that have not yet been explored. Uh, the chimney base, we were able to map, uh, identify its location very nicely. So we could say that actually the chimney was in this room here. There would have been a wall here and a large room here. University of Maryland folks found a whole bunch of medicine bottles and bed springs and stuff like that. And they thought, well, that means that this was the bedroom, the smaller room. But what it looks like is this thing had a second floor. And all that material, the bed springs and medicine bottles and all that was from upstairs. And when the building collapsed, it all kind of flattened out onto one two-dimensional surface. There's still a lot more work that could be done on this site. Here's sort of a close-up view of it. These contour lines represent window glass. And we seem to have two concentrations on either side of unit two. And that's why I think there are windows here and here. This unit number three produced a bunch of vessel glass, uh, I'm sorry, window glass, which suggests that there was a window here as well. We have our chimney base here. Must have been a door in unit seven because unit four exposed a brick walkway. And the door on the north side is hypothetical, but I, we could probably make a pretty good case for one being there as well. One of the most interesting finds from that site, Brown Tenancy, you could see the obverse and reverse. I'm afraid they're not particularly good photographs. Um, this is a Paris exhibition medallion from 1889. This is on a tenant farmer house, probably African-American. A lot of these things were probably occupied by African-American households, but a lot of them, at least for some part of their lifespan, were may well have been occupied by European American households as well. But we have this medallion sitting on this site. Is it possible that the people who lived in that house made the trip to Paris in 1889 for the basically the World's Fair of the time? It, it, it seems unlikely. Um, and it suggests some relationship with the people who lived in the big house nearby either a gift, they went to the Paris exhibition and brought this back and gave it to a favorite tenant or a servant, or that tenant or servant accompanied the family, the Selmans, to the exhibition to act as their servants and pick this up him or herself. We have one other instance of this that I'll mention this evening in a little bit, but this is, a, this is from the other side of the world at this little house. One house site we recently found in Charles County down near Trinity Church, uh, which is sort of south central Charles County, 
Um, I know it seems like a bit of a mess here, but um, actually it's 956. No, this is actually near, um, not, not, not far west of Hughesville. And we found remains of probably two structures on the site. And you can see in this photograph here, a line of brick. So this is one of those structures. And it's, it's actually probably chimney fall rather than actual foundation. In fact, you could probably barely make some out, uh, follow the line off in this direction. And there was a standing structure there, an outbuilding, which we're able to record. That suggests the site was occupied until recent decades anyway. On the surface, these are three different objects. Here are parts of stoves. Um, these from the same one, it's sort of an enameled uh, cast iron stove. And this is the oval top of some sort of large parlor stove. So we have two heating units. And that may be because we possibly have uh, two different structures here, two dwellings. Let's see if we can make this go. There we go. And now this is down by Trinity, Trinity Church in South Central Charles County. And yeah, you just walk through the woods and you know, it all looks like there's not much there. It looks like it's a natural woodland. It isn't. All this is natural reforestation of the last, in this case, probably about 50 years. I took this picture, it's Mike uh, Eibel there, uh, standing in front of this overturned tree. These overturned trees are pretty common on these kinds of sites too. And what they suggest is that these sites have very thin soils and they are poorly drained. And so the trees, you get very large trees, but they don't have deep root systems. So it doesn't take much for them to fall over. So they are pretty common on these sites. I would say that's one of the things that links these sites together is that there's relatively little flat land around them, or if there's a lot, it tends to be very poorly drained. So not ideal for agriculture. And this view, you, you could see some of the bricks right here in the foreground. I first walked over this site before preparing a bid, bid for the client and walked right through here and didn't even notice the brick. Uh, it, it was when we were actually out flagging the site, getting ready to shovel test it, that we discovered the brick on the surface. And here you could see two of these units exposed a brick walkway. And there's a reason to have a brick walkway there. Again, the soils are very thin and poorly drained. This is probably a mud hole. You wouldn't know it today because it's all reforested. It has all this you know, thick fallen leaves on it, but this probably was a bit of a mud hole every time it rained. In unit four, you could see uh, the chimney base and unit nine, you could see some of the chimney falls. So that chimney fell uh, towards the lower left part of the screen. The circles with the numbers, those were all metal detector hits. One of the tools we're using to explore these sites instead of doing a lot of shovel testing is metal detectors. Again, they are late historic sites. They're essentially on the surface. There's not a lot of point doing a lot of digging. Even with these excavation units, they're really removing the root mat. <laughs> and whatever, you know, the, the, the walkways, the, the, the chimneys, they're really all right under the root mat. There's no significant excavation. Metal detecting seems to be a better way of finding the limits of these sites and finding where the structures are. So here in the upper right is the chimney base in place. You can still see mortar on the brick. So there was you know, several courses at least that were here. And immediately to the left, we found this pattern again, just removing the root mat and just whisk grooming this down. You could see, that's a collapsed chimney. That's a classic collapsed chimney. So the bricks are still in the proper position, but the whole thing has just fallen over. And the two images in the bottom part are the brick walkway uh, that we exposed. So you could see it here is a brick walkway. The dwelling is here. We don't know how large it was. You know, we just didn't do uh, enough scratching around. It looks like it's pretty beat. We found some evidence of brick piers, but uh, 
going to require a fair amount of effort to fully expose the, this building so we can get a sense of how big it was. Because remember, it, it's held up by brick piers and you know there's no foundation, there's no cellar hole. So they don't leave a very deep trace in, in the earth. Up to towards the right, we had an outbuilding. You could still see timbers on the ground with wire nails sticking out of them. Metal detecting produced a lot of agricultural implements and other large pieces of metal. So it's some sort of outbuilding probably related to uh, cultivation. And then judging from the amount of ceramic and ves uh, uh, glass vessel shirts we found, uh, we probably have two midden areas, two garbage dumps. Some examples of some of the stuff we found. Uh, you know, this is all 20th century stuff. Um, you can see certainly the bottle over here. There's an Owens type bottle, it's your you know, classic Coke bottle, post 1903, 1904, something like that. And everything else here is easily 20th century. We've got the base of a fruit jar, and I still don't remember what the date on that is, but it's probably like 1910, 1920. A hoe and a cast iron vessel. It's kind of flat, so it's not clear that it's a cauldron type thing. It may be more of a like a skillet, cast iron skillet. And then there's this. The actual find is uh, upper left and, and uh, lower left. So front and back of this thing. You can see lettering here, town. 1907. Uh, Esther Reed, uh, county, the Charles County archaeologist, directed me to a nice example of Jamestown Exposition, 1907. That's what this is. And you see the uh, from a postcard, the uh, the pavilion for the exhibition is exactly the same as this one on these on this enameled or cloisonné type pen. Were these people at the 1907 Jamestown Exposition? I don't know, maybe. Um, we know that uh, teachers, uh, public school teachers uh, during the summer, during summers, uh, would often, uh, if they could afford to, go to these teacher institutes. And also, if they could find funding, would go to these world's fairs that were held in this country. So that's a possible connection. Um, somehow this artifact found its way to this site. And like the 1989, 1889 Paris Exposition Medal, it's really interesting because we tend to look at these sites, which to begin with, we find usually in the middle of the woods in fairly quite rural areas. So they're really, by our standards today, they're really on the edge of the earth, out of the middle of nowhere. And so we tend to think of the people who are living at these things as living fairly isolated lives, uh, especially before widespread adoption of, uh, uh, first of all, rural electrification in the 1930s and 40s, and then uh, widespread adoption of the radio, which created national culture, linked people together. Plus, of course, automobiles after World War I. So we, we tend to think of these people as living fairly isolated lives, but we have two artifacts here that suggest that they're not as isolated as we might think. And this is just something we found through metal detecting. Uh, it could be that if we look at more of these sites more carefully using metal detection, uh, put a little more time and effort into it, but we might find more evidence uh, of links between these seemingly isolated rural sites and essentially major world events. So, so something really worth exploring. So before we got started, you know, we were just sort of chatting and I was talking about developing a database. This is, you know, not any, it's nowhere near complete. There's just a few sites, uh, not even through putting all the data that we do have in it. But this is the kind of thing I'm thinking about and that I'd like to add to. And that is, uh, you know, find these sites, the names, the project names happen to be my, you know, commercial archaeology projects, but it doesn't have to be one. You know, if you're uh, Bob, 
went around the woods near Yahoo and we'll give it some name or another and a date. And then we start looking at, well, how many buildings are represented? Are they, are they dwellings? Do we have one dwelling and uh, one or more outbuildings? That's the kind of information we try to ascertain. Um, is there a certain pattern to them? Are they on sort of uh, uh, south facing slopes, which suggests that they're built and oriented in such a way as to catch the warming rays of the sun, uh, especially during the cooler months? Uh, what is the plan? Are they hall and parlor or is it a single room? We had that one uh, house site in Crownsville. It looks like a you know, field stone foundation. Chances are that was a log house. Actually, two of the places we found uh, in the Crownsville area were probably log structures, which people were making well into the 20th century. Uh, maybe that one was simply a one room uh, building with a kind of an addition for storage. How big are they? You know, let's get the dimensions down. And what are they made of? I mean, I don't think, we're not gonna, by definition, none of them are gonna be masonry, probably. They're all either gonna be frame or they're gonna be log construction. Uh, log is easiest to see when you're doing a lot of metal detecting and find very few nails. Or you find a whole bunch of nails, but they are for another building, apart from where you're finding the footer for what appears to be the dwelling. That's usually some frame outbuilding. So this is some of the data, and we can certainly expand on this, but we really need to start finding these sites and stop, you know, writing them off. There are a lot of people who live in these places, and by disregarding them, by saying that they're not historically significant, uh, number one, we don't get the chance to do more work on them, to actually learn something from them. And number two, we're really dismissing a large percentage of the population of the area. And again, most of them are probably African-American, but by now means all of them. And some of these houses, especially those that were rentals, they were tenancies, um, chances are there's a whole succession of uh, households moving through them, uh, some white, some black, some possibly mixed. So it's, it's something we want to explore further. So to kind of wrap it up, you know, what's a small house? Again, we're looking at 300 to 600 square feet. Uh, actually, we're likely to push that number down to maybe 250 to 600 square feet. They tend to be supported by brick or stone piers, or they have field stone footers. Those that have field stone footers are probably log construction. Uh, they're heated with a stove. As you know, you can see with the chimney base and also chimney fall and stove parts. But again, with the uh, one of the log structures may well have had an open hearth made of stone. Uh, we'd have to do some excavation there to, to, to determine that. Associated outbuildings, one, maybe two. I don't think we're seeing more than that at this point. And they seem to be either all purpose storage or their agricultural structures and we're finding mostly agricultural tools around them. Horseshoes, hose, uh, parts of saws maybe, or uh, parts of plow, plowshares are not uncommon on these sites. They're late, they're uh, post bellum, you know, post civil war and probably later than that. And more often than not, they're on what I would call suboptimal land. That is land that's just not very useful very good for agriculture. It's either poorly drained or it's up on a ridge top where there's very little acreage to farm on a large scale. And then there's a the question of, you know, what about these exhibition souvenirs? What's going on here? How are these people connected to the world? One thing we need to start looking for, and archaeologists haven't really gotten around to that this in this part of the uh, country, I think we need to start looking for radio parts. Um, well, I think it's with the 1930 or the 1940 census is actually one of the things the census marshals were asking people is, do you have a radio set? And radios are really important nationally because whether you live on, you know, on the West Coast like Jim Breedlove or, you know, you live around here or you uh, live in some hall in Tennessee, if you have a source of electricity and you have a radio, you are connected to the rest of the world. You can listen to the speeches of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
You can listen to baseball games played in different parts of the country. Uh, you can listen to um, religious folks who, uh, who are giving services over the radio or the, the infamous uh, Catholic priest who is preaching racism over the radio. Um, it's really a way of connecting to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. These medallions uh, suggest that that is already going on long before the radio is available. And so I think we need to keep our eyes uh, open and look for these things. The uh, Paris medallion, by the way, is on exhibition at the um, uh, at Cirque in our new exhibit. So I think that's all I have for now. Uh, I'm open to questions. So there was a question in the chat from Cindy, and this was in reference to a previous slide, and it says, how would the larger room have been heated? I think what is going on, that's a good question. I think what's going on for the most part, and we could see it when we find standing structures, there's actually one I didn't uh, uh, illustrate this evening, and that's the down tenancy, which is also on Cirque property in Anne Arundel County. For those of you who don't know what I'm referring to, Circus Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, we're a unit of the Smithsonian Institution in Anne Arundel County. And at the down tenancy, you, you, know, you can see it's a standing structure. There's a stove chimney. I think in most cases, if you could look at these stove chimneys, you'll see that there's a aperture for a stove pipe on both sides. So the chimney stack is serving two stoves in two different rooms. I think we'll find that that's pretty common. And with the demolished, with these buildings that have collapsed, one of the ways we can see that is with a lot of these stove chimneys, you know, they have the circular hole for the stove pipe to go in. Very often they use what's called a, a thimble, a chimney thimble, which is, it looks like a red earthenware pot with the bottom cut off. And that thimble would fit into the brickwork and the stovepipe would go through the thimble. So it was sort of a bearing. It's sort of, you know, uh, made for a tighter fit of the stovepipe with the brick and was probably easily filled in with mortar. So if we find two of those thimbles on a site near a chimney stack, that suggests that there were two stoves heating uh, each room. Otherwise, it's possible that one stove heated one room, the other room was effectively unheated. Um, and I can see that as being very possible too. If you have two stoves, you're using twice as much fuel and that's expensive. I hope that answers your question, Cindy. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have one. Um, and I would type it, except that I'm incredibly slow. Um, is LIDAR a reasonable method to look for candidate sites? Um, by LIDAR, I assume you mean the sort of generic LIDAR that we all have access to, you know, at least for the state of Maryland. I would say no, because the resolution is too poor. Uh, with that LIDAR, we're looking at elevation differences of about two feet, and these sites are virtually flat. Now, if you were able to fly, a drone over the area and it worked at a much higher resolution. Let's say it was giving us differences of a quarter of a foot. Yeah, we could pick up some sites that way. Not all of them though. A lot of them like the uh, one where the uh, Jamestown pin came from, it's virtually flat. <laughs> There's no elevation to it. I mean, the bricks, you know, they're bricks on the surface, but you know, they, they barely stick up at all. Uh, now, I think the best way to find these sites, and that's why one of the reasons I'm talking about this tonight, is having feet on the ground. You know, those of you who have wooded areas near you and, you know, you have tacit or explicit approval to be on the land. If you're walking around, you can find these sites and you can let me know about it. Maybe we can collect some information on them. Uh, and if they're endangered, maybe do some work on them just to increase the database. Right now, we don't have any, you know, other than these, the summary I had before you, we don't have any real patterns showing up at this point because we don't have a sample. 
I think if we go through the state records of archaeological sites, we can perhaps get some information, but most archaeologists aren't collecting this kind of data out in the field. They're simply noting a late historic site that's flattened, um, and the, there are probably many standing versions of it, or so the argument goes, and therefore the site isn't historically significant. But I would argue that, no, there are very few standing examples of these, and where they are, they're very different because, uh, like that first one I showed with the Gaither House in, uh, near the airport, you know, it's been expanded and occupied for, I think, three generations now. So it's not typical of the kinds of sites that I'm talking about. So we need boots on the ground. So Jim, uh, this is Carol. I know. And, okay. Uh, you did some work on Fenwick Road and there were, uh, there was one outline of a brick building, that house that was down and to the south, there was also um, the remain where well, there were the these flat stones that were spaced that were supposedly the outline of the building, and mm -hmm. that particular building had stove parts in it, which would imply it was a building. So they, we assume those were part of a plantation or something. But is that of interest? I mean, it is of interest. Uh, I know the site you talk about. I remember it. Um, I don't remember what details we collected on. I know we did some work on it. Um, but yeah, uh, now it may turn out that it's more of a farmstead and a little, you know, kind of a different order of, uh, of phenomena than these small houses I'm talking about. But by collecting information on them and putting them in the database, we could start sorting these things out statistically. It might turn out that it's 20 by 30 feet and has other qualities mm -hmm. about it that suggest it's not, you know, in this group of small houses. So small houses is be like the whole, it, it's their whole within themselves. Yeah, and it's probably some sort of continuum. There's probably not a real sharp break between, I mean, even small houses. What the hell does that mean? It's just a, yeah. it's just a term I came up with to try to begin thinking about these things. Or a small homestead or something like that. Well, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of them are probably tenant houses. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't even call them homesteads. Uh, but I think if we collect enough information on these kinds of rural sites, we'll see a pretty decent break between what I'm talking about here and that next order of small farmsteads, mm -hmm. small homesteads, and then, of course, much larger, complex ones with lots of different buildings. I suspect one of the defining features will be the number uh, and kinds of outbuildings. What I'm talking about here probably is only one or two outbuildings, if you don't include the privy. And, um, you know, the kind of general storage and mostly agricultural stuff, as opposed to that farmstead I showed you right after the Bel Air Mansion slide, which has a whole bunch of buildings there. Tobacco barns, there's corn cribs, and all this other stuff. And that's not what we're talking about. Those farmsteads are already getting a fair amount of attention. It's these small things and of you know fairly late small houses that are basically written off on a regular basis. So would there I, be, go ahead. Jim, would there be anything in historical archives uh, that might indicate like ownership of that land and shed some light on what was happening there? Well, we do title search on the properties. We generally come up with pretty ambiguous results. Uh, or, you know, it's pretty clear that this is part of a large tract of land, and the owner of that tract of land did not live in that dumpy little house. You know, they were yeah. living somewhere else in a big house, a, you know, complex farmstead. So identifying the occupants of these buildings is really difficult. I suspect most of them were tenancies. and. Um, Tenant houses are a real problem because, yeah, sometimes you'll have the same household in it for a generation or two, but more often than not, there's just a series of households that move through them every couple, three years uh, as they move from one farm to another to work. Um, so identify, we, what we'll end up doing, I think, largely is identifying people who occupy these small houses as a class of people, as kind of tenants, uh, probably. Um, uh, transient 
tenants who, you know, almost like, um, you know, like migrant farm workers, you know, where every few years or every year, every few years, they're moving from one uh, place to another. Um, and so we'll be dealing with them as a class of people rather than individual named households, because in most cases, we won't know the names, at least of all the households who occupied the site. They really are a, um, uh, a, a marginalized people, a, a quiet people, a people about whom, you know, they're, they're the backbone of the workforce, at least especially of the agricultural workforce, but they have no names historically. I mean, we, we can't, you know, they, they don't show up in the written records very much unless, you know, they got in some trouble with the law. Um, and even then, connecting those judicial records with a house with a house site is very difficult. So yeah, Indeed. I think we may end up dealing with them as you know, kind of a class of people rather than as individual households. Do you think that um, most of these places are not documented in the snapshots of the census? Yeah, I, I mean, well, I mean, that's an interesting question because, you know, we all know that the census is not 100%. And mm -hmm. I think most of us are pretty confident that a lot of African-American households occupying, you know, places that are well off the road were probably skipped. Partly because of, you know, the census marshal being a racist and just didn't think they amounted to being people to maybe just sheer laziness. Like, I'm not gonna go all the way down that nasty road just to count three people. Um, so that could be part of it. Um, but we know, we know the census isn't complete and we can't easily link folks who are in the census to the folks who are on the ground. I mean, Ray knows this better than anybody because mm -hmm. He's been working on his project for five years, trying to do that, do this with actually established farms, you know, people who have some wealth and some uh, uh, profile in the community. And here we are talking about folks who have virtually no profile in the community, no wealth to speak of. So trying to link the census data with these individual house sites is probably not worth the effort. It probably just isn't going to happen. Would there, would, there be, would there be anything on the landowners that might indicate that they had tenants that would say this is, might be a place we'd want to look for small well, houses? If, if we got one of these house sites and it was on a 300 acre tract, I think we can assume that, you know, there was a large landowner there and renting these things out, probably to people who either were laborers for that farm or you know, just rented small, you know, a small uh, parcel, you know, that they did some large scale gardening on for, for home use and maybe to sell some of the, pro or trade some of this produce. But unless you have ledgers for each of these farms that mm -hmm. show who their tenants are year after year, you know, which houses they lived in, where those houses were, those ledges almost certainly exist, but not in any kind of systematic way. I think we'd be lucky to find a couple, but you know, they they simply don't survive if they ever existed. This is a little bit like doing Aboriginal archaeology, where you know, you find a site, you know, you probably have an extended household that lives on this Native American site, but you don't know who they were. You don't know their name certainly. And you couldn't even, I'm often asked, well, what tribe? And we don't know, you know, and the further back in time we go, the less possible it becomes to even identify the group of people that they, of which they were a part, uh, or, you know, certainly of their language. And these folks seem to be almost equally, I won't say invisible, but unidentifiable as to individual, we can't get at individuals. Uh, but that, just because you can't get at individuals, I mean, Bel Air Mansion, yeah, we know who lived there from 1747, you know, on up till the time it became a public building. Uh, we know all the people who owned it and lived in it. Uh, but 
sites like this, we don't know. And do we then simply disregard them because we don't know who they were? Or do we try to attack from another direction and just, again, treat them as a class of people rather than as identifiable households? I, I, I vote for, let, let's take a look at them, see what we can learn. It's funny, there's a lot of theoretical work in historical archeology, span and they don't address these sites at all, especially those that purport to be Marxist in, in approach. You know, it's like, these are the people you're supposed to be studying, you know, and you keep, you, know, you spend all your time working around these grand 18th century mansions. This is where it's at, these, these little house, house, uh, house lots. Uh, and so I think as we build more information on them, we can then begin to theorize about them. We can develop theories and research questions and start getting a better uh, understanding of this part of um, rural Maryland society. But if we keep disregarding them, you know, we'll never get a full picture. Any other questions? Hearing none, I will stop sharing the images. There we go. So um, there will be no talk next month because you all be partying and you know be under the weather or whatever. Um, we will do this, pick this up again in late January. Uh, I don't recall exactly what the order is. We have two that are scheduled, and I had given several other topics to Allison for subsequent months. I think in January might be the aviation catapults. And I, yes, I believe so. <laughs> aviation catapults. Before I moved to Maryland, I considered myself to be an industrial archaeologist, which meant I studied industrial sites, mill sites brick factories, cheese factories, wheelwright shops, stuff like that. 30 plus years ago, I moved to Southern Maryland and discovered there's no industry down here. <laughs> and so I got involved in, you know, mostly you know, 17th century plantation uh, archeology, span certainly for my dissertation. Uh, but occasionally we do have industrial type sites to look at. And two of these sites uh, came up a couple of years ago and that is these subterranean facilities for launching military aircraft for experimental purposes at the Naval Air Station at Pax River in St. Mary's County. And so one of them was a hydro pneumatic launch, and the other one was a state of the art electromagnetic launching mm -hmm. system, which was sort of like space age at the time. It, it never, if you'll excuse the phrase, it never got off the ground. Um, <laughs> But nowadays, with the new kinds of aircraft carriers that are coming out, the new Ford class, it's all electromagnetics. So although it may not sound like archaeology, it is. I mean, it's a site. You know, we go into these sites. We document them. In this case, didn't have to do any digging. Uh, we did have to climb down these holes into these underneath the runways in the dark, you know, water-filled caverns, <laughs> and try to document what was down there. Uh, but it's, I think, pretty interesting stuff. And so um, don't put off by, don't be put off by the subject matter. I think you might find it kind of interesting. And it's a kind of hi history that relates to, you know, our lives today. Again, they, they just launched the new uh, uh, USS Gerald R. Ford, a new class of aircraft carrier, just weeks ago uh, out of Norfolk, I think. And all of its systems are electrical runoff and nuclear reactor. And so it doesn't use steam catapults or hydro pneumatics. It's using electromagnetic catapults for its aircraft. This is the same technology that we're using on maglev railroads. Mm -hmm. You know, these high speed, you know, the Japanese yeah. are really uh, in the forefront of it. And we were, we're still designing one for Maryland actually, but you know, it's all electromagnetic. So it's a technology that's been around for over a century and it's starting to come into its own, mostly through the military. So be there or be square. Mm -hmm.